I, I came upon this project um, out of the blue. Uh, I was not anticipating the publication of this book. I had no ambitions to write the introduction to it. I was um, enjoying my first sabbatical from Westminster Seminary, uh, and I got a phone call from uh, Dr. Lilbach, the president of Westminster. And that doesn't happen every day, um, but he asked me if I would consider writing the introduction. And I had some other writing projects lined up, but uh, this one jumped to the top, and I was very pleased to hear about Westminster Seminary Press uh, republishing this book. I had the copy from the the Zilstra text from, I believe, 56, and um, really enjoyed it, knew of the value of this work by Bovink. And, uh, and, and when I heard especially that, uh, that Bobbing's original foreword getting translated for this edition, it, I was even more excited. And, and Gray Sutanto of uh, world traveling Indonesian reformed theology fame has done an excellent job uh, translating Bobbing's original foreword. And then, as you mentioned, uh, Charles Williams uh, provides a wonderful scriptural index. Uh, the publication of the book itself reaches back uh, to an idea of uh, some of our friends that you'll know, Ben Dalving and Josh Curry. Uh, Ben's since moved on from Westminster Press and the bookstore, uh, but Josh Curry uh, helps coordinate publications. And, and they uh, knew that this book would be a, an excellent choice to try to, um, to revamp for a public audience. And it just has taken a couple of years for that to develop, um, but they've, they've pulled it off and uh, I'm very thankful to see it in print. Yeah. I was introduced to the book um, before coming to seminary. It was on the Westminster uh, Theological Seminary pre-seminary reading list, which people who've listened to the program for a while knew I, that I, that's kind of how I was introduced to the seminary early on. I got hooked on Van Til, which sent me to Westminster, which, you know, they had a reading list on the website. And it took me three years to read through that list, but I read all of it. And um, while I was working full time, but one of the books was Bovink's Our Reasonable Faith. And part of the reason why that was on there and not the whole Reform Dogmatics was the whole Reform Dogmatics had not been published, uh, I think, uh, in, in English. Uh, the translations had not been accomplished or finished and uh, hadn't been released by, by Baker. And so what we're seeing now, uh, I'm no Bovink expert, but we've been talking about Bovink and, and with, with Gray and with James Eglinton, Corey Brock, and others that have been on the program recently to, to talk about various projects. Uh, but um, I'm no, no modern historian either, but it seems as if now with the introduction of uh, Bovink's Reform Dogmatics beginning in 03, if I'm not mistaken, um, that has led to a wave of interest of younger theologians reading and studying Herman Bovink, which now, 16, 17 years after the introduction of that first volume, has led to another wave now of, of further study, further translations. And so it goes to show, I guess, the, the power of the Anglophones, <laughs> you know, and, and just how much of the Reformed world is, is kind of revolving around the English language, which from one perspective is kind of sad. But uh, from another, um, we're very thankful that there is at least somewhat of, an, of a lingua franca because none of the rest of us know Latin anymore. Uh, but, you know, reading Our Reasonable Faith was a tremendous um, uh, experience for me. It, w it was very helpful to have a single volume systematic theology. And I read that not too far from the time that I also read Louis Burkhoff's single volume uh, systematic theology. But there, there's something about Bovink and just the way that he writes and thinks. And he's, he's absolutely one of my favorites. And um, I'm so glad that this book now is available and useful for people. So, Charles, what about your experience? Did you read uh, Our Reasonable Faith years ago, or did you just start cutting your teeth right, you know, reading R.D. and the Dutch from, from the cradle? <laughs> uh, no, I uh, my introduction to Our Reasonable Faith was actually through Carl Truman. Uh, we ended up reading a good chunk of Our Reasonable Faith uh, in seminary in some of my later SD courses uh, towards the end of my time, uh, but I ended up doing an internship with Carl Truman um, in 2013, summer 2013. And one of the things that he would have us do is he and I would get together every Friday with a couple other guys and read through a couple chapters a week and just do a roundtable discussion. In fact, uh, as Carlton mentioned, the number of guys who've been kind of uh, integral in the re-release of this are all from the same church. 
Um, ben Dalvang was a ruling elder at Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. Josh Curry is a deacon there. Carl Truman was really uh, integral in, in getting the project pushed forward uh, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, I was involved in it. Uh, Carlton wrote the introduction. Um, and then of course, as, as for anybody who's purchased the book, the, the book is actually dedicated to the memory of Gene Gaffin, right. Dr. Gaffin's wife, who is also uh, uh, at our church. And so, you know, this is largely a labor of love uh, from just a small little outpost in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Um, mm-hmm. And I just remember just really um, coming to love our reasonable faith. I, I think I walked away by the end of my time in seminary that it was the most meaningful book to me in a lot of ways, in that it articulates an understanding of God that's not simply relegated to kind of the, the dusty atmosphere, um, but that it is a, a true confession of faith on how it is our comfort in, in life and in death. Uh, it's meant an awful lot to me, not just in terms of what, what it, uh, how Bavink writes, but also in terms of the friendships that developed in the course of this, um, mm-hmm. over the course of those years.